Hello, today is April 10th, 2021. My name is Mallory Gonzalez. I'm interviewing Mariah, Gonz Mariah Osuna for the University Library Special Collections and Archives at the, at the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley, hereafter abbreviated as UTRGV. This project is in, is in partnership with the Voces Oral History Center at the University of Texas at Austin. Please know, Ms. Osuna, that this interview will be placed in the university's library special collections and archives at UTRGV and shared with the Voces Oral History Center at the University of Texas at Austin. If there's anything you do not wish to answer or talk about, I will honor your wishes. Also, if there is something you want to talk about, please bring it up and we will talk about it. The University Library Special Collections and Archives will archive your interview along with any other photographs and other documentation you are willing to share. UTRGV University Library will retain copyright or non-exclusive right to the interview and any other material you donate to Special Collections and Archives at UTRGV. Because we are not conducting this interview in person, I need to record you consenting to make sure you agree with our interview procedures before we continue. So I'll ask you a series of six questions. Please say, yes, I agree, or no, I do not agree after each question. Do you give University Library Special Collections and Archives at UTRGV consent to archive your interview and your materials at the UTRGV University Library? Yes, I agree. Do you grant UTRGV University Libra Library Special Collections and Archives right, title, and interest in copyright over the interview and any materials you provide? Yes, I agree. Do you agree to allow UTRGV University Library Special Collections and Archives to post this interview on the internet where it may be viewed by people around the world? I agree. Do you grant the University Library Special Collections and Archives consent to share your Zoom interview with the Voces Oral History Center at the University of Texas at Austin for inclusion in the Voices of a Pandemic Oral History mini project, which will include posting the interview on the internet? I agree. As you recall, we previously filled out a pre-interview form. We use information from the pre-interview form to help in research. The entire form is kept in a secure VOCES server at the University of Texas at Austin. Before VOCES sends it to UTRGV University Library Special Collections and Archives, we would have stripped out any contact information for yourself or family members, so that will not be part of your public file. Your public file will only be accessible at UTRGV University Library. The final two questions ask for your consent on what I just described. Do you wish for us, for us to share the rest of your interview in a public file available to researchers at UTRGV University Library Special Collections and Archives? I agree. On occasion, UTRGV Special Collections and Archives and bosses receive requests from journalists <coughs> who wish to contact our interview subjects. We only deal with legitimate news outlets. Do you give consent for us to share your phone numbers or email with journalists? I agree. Thank you. <clears throat> your experiences and stories mean a lot to us at UTRGV Special Collections and Archives. I look forward to what you say in the interview questions I will now ask. Mariah, thank you for your time. <clears throat> like I said earlier, your stories and experiences are valuable to us at UTRGV Special Collections and Archives and the Voces Project. Particularly for us at UTRGV Special Collections, we are committed to preserving the stories of Mexican Americans and Latinos from South Texas and the Rio Grande Valley, and those who work closely with these populations during this COVID-19 pandemic. Because you are a lawyer that has felt the hardships of COVID-19, and because you are a daughter, sister, and friend who is knowledgeable of the ways COVID-19 has affected others in her inner circle, I know you have many meaningful stories and experiences to share on how COVID-19 has impacted these roles you carry out in your life. So, before I ask you to share stories about your life in this pandemic, tell us, who is Mariah Ozuna? Uh, I am a 29-year-old first-generation attorney in my family. Uh, I work doing personal injury law. Um, and I'm originally from the Rio Grande Valley. Great. Okay. 
Thank you for that. So first thing <clears throat> I want to ask you is, when did you first hear about COVID-19? How did you learn about it? Like the radio, TV, children, social media, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> I think I remember hearing about COVID probably through Twitter. Uh, at that time, I wasn't watching a lot of news because it was engulfed with a lot of politics uh, and it gave me a lot of high anxiety. So Twitter was my news source. Um, and I'm pretty sure that that was the first time I remember hearing about COVID was whenever it broke in Wuhan, China, uh, and it, it hit the internet and it hit the news. Um, and that was probably yeah, the primary source of where, where I first heard the information from. Okay. Um, and what was your first reaction to the information about COVID? Uh, we're on, we're on Twitter. Nobody really takes things seriously. Uh, so I, I didn't really take it too serious. Um, I wasn't too sure. Uh, I'm not very versed in uh, pandemics. I didn't realize that they occur actually every hundred years or so. Uh, so it was right on point for us to get one. So I wasn't, I, I was very uncertain, didn't really take it too serious, uh, didn't really understand the extent of how severe it could get, didn't understand how transmissible, how serious the virus actually was at the time. And at what point did you realize this pandemic was a serious life altering event or do you not think it's serious? Uh, I think I probably first realized that whenever it hit the U.S. and then started spreading very quickly and then we had our first death in the U.S. and then it got it got real at that point. We knew that this was something that was, you know, taking people's lives, uh, something that was spreading very fast. And then we shut down in March. Um, and once we shut down spring break and we shut down schools. I understood at that point that this was probably something that was very serious because we don't ever shut down schools for anything. So, uh, or shut down, uh, you know, cities and counties, et cetera. So that's at that point, I realized that we're dealing with something that um, is, is of the century and something that we haven't seen before. Right, I agree. Um, over the last few months, what news media, social media, or other sources do you rely on to keep you informed about coronavirus? Um, CNN, uh, CNN, ABC, uh, MSNBC, mainly CNN uh, as my news source, my news outlet that I go to. <clears throat> um, as far as social media, I would say Twitter, definitely Twitter. It uh, started to get a lot more serious and a lot more news started coming out on Twitter, keeping people up to date uh, and Instagram as well. Every once in a while, um, you know, I follow a couple of different news sources on Instagram and they would post stats and uh, other things like that. So those are the top three that I would say I would use definitely to get information, even to this day, to get information on COVID. Okay. And can you share with me what you understand about COVID-19 as an infectious disease and any of its variants? Likewise, can you share with me what you don't understand about this new coronavirus? Um, I understand that it's a, well, coronavirus is a type of virus. Uh, and it could range from being cold-like, very mild symptoms to something very serious, as in this variant is very serious, this COVID-19 variant. Uh, so I understand that. I understand that this is type of a, a, a century type of thing. It, it occurs apparently every century, uh, which would make sense because we had the Spanish influenza, um, you know, back in the early 19th century, I think for the 1918 or 1919 type of time frame. Um, and now I'm understanding uh, that it changes just like the flu. Uh, you know, it could be one type of variant at one point, and now we're seeing multiple types of variants pop up because it's mutating. Uh, it's getting stronger, so it's something that we have to keep up with, that science has to keep up with, that uh, you know, us as a society is going to need to keep up with probably for a very long time, especially with uh, the severity of the symptoms and how it could affect um, different types of people, uh, just depending on age or even health, underlying health issues that you don't know you have, uh, which kind of goes into, I guess, what I don't really understand about it, uh, and that is how it would primarily affect older people to a detrimental way. Um, 
but it also does that with healthy young people as well, even though it's not as, as uh, prevalent to see younger people be, um, I guess, killed by the virus, it still happens. And I think that that's very interesting uh, that you just don't know. It doesn't really discriminate at this point. I mean, we have statistics and data showing uh, certain populations of, of uh, society get affected harder than others. But at the end of the day, that's not always the case. There's still young people who are getting severely affected by it, young people who are dying from it, older people who are okay from it as well. Uh, you know, even if they're smokers or have heart issues or et cetera. Um, I think that that is very interesting. It's something that I don't really understand. And I know that as the science comes out, we'll find out more about it. But from the information we have now, um, you know, it's kind of not uh, adding up in a sense completely. No, yeah, I completely agree. <clears throat> um, can you tell me what you know about the various vaccines available to the public? And how do you feel about these vaccines? Um, well, I know that there is uh, Moderna, Pfizer, Johnson & Johnson. Um, I, I know that, you know, they started to try to develop them as soon as possible once the uh, the Chinese government, the scientists over there were able to, um, I guess, transcribe the mRNA or the DNA of the, of the virus. And I know that, uh, you know, everybody around the world is working very hard to try to, to try to get vaccines pumped out. Um, I personally have Pfizer. I was able to, to get the vaccine, which I'm extremely grateful for. Uh, so it's not something that I have any negative view of. I feel like vaccines are, are extremely important. We have to get them uh, in order to stop uh, highly transmittable diseases and then stop any types of diseases, you know, uh, polio, chickenpox, et cetera. Um, so I'm not one that is not on board with vaccines. I trust, I trust the science. I trust the scientists. Uh, you know, these people, there's people that dedicate their lives like Dr. Fauci uh, to tracking, um, you know, uh, pandemics to tracking highly transmittable diseases that work on these these types of uh, vaccines or help um, provide data and, and very critical uh, scientific research to trying to create vaccines. So I'm very much on board with it. I think it's great that we've been able to roll out vaccines at a very high level now. Uh, I think that's very important. Um, and I think that more people just need to educate themselves on it. It's not, you know, a lot of people think it's about putting the virus in your body and it's not that at all. It's a copy of the virus uh, and it makes your body stronger. And I think that, you know, it's our fault as a society for not properly educating people as to the importance of why we need them, especially in a situation like this, where we have a highly transmittable disease, a disease that is, um, you know, can cause severe uh, symptoms, could cause death. And I think that as a nation, we kind of felt at not educating people enough, um, not making that information widely available, actually. I mean, you can, you can post it all over the place. You can post it on Twitter, you can post it on Facebook, you know. We have platforms to be able to reach people, to be able to educate people, and to put things in lay terms. And I don't think we've done that. And I think that that has caused a lot of skepticism in the vaccine, um, and it's caused a lot of skepticism in, in our government who is distributing the vaccine. Uh, so, I think we need to do definitely a better job at that, but I am I am very happy with with the rollout so far and with the amount of people that have been willing to receive one and have gotten one because it's going to help us at the end of the day uh, as a society to be able to get through this thing. Yes, thank you for that. Um, do you have an do you have a vaccination story you would like to share <clears throat> now or perhaps later in this interview? Um. Sure. I mean, I think my story is probably like most people's stories. Um, uh, I received the first dose and, you know, my arm felt like it was dead uh, for about 12 hours. Um, three weeks later, got my second dose and that one really knocked me back pretty hard. Uh, um, body aches, just mainly body aches, I think was the one thing. I didn't have a fever. Uh, I didn't really get um, any type of cold-like symptoms or flu-like symptoms besides the body aches, but it did feel like I had a, a, about 100 extra pounds on my body that I was carrying around that I wasn't used to. Uh, the smallest, simplest things was just 
so taxing on me and took a lot of uh, energy out of me, even just from moving positions on the couch or getting up to get water was something that uh, was very taxing on my body, but it went away after about 12 hours. And I'm very grateful and very happy that I'm vaccinated and I'm able to um, kind of walk around a little bit in the outdoors and get out a little bit and not feel as uh, nervous or scared or have uh, the anxiety of it all. I agree. I feel that exact same way. Um, now, for the last um, last question I have for this section, do your family members hold the same beliefs as you about COVID-19? Or are there some who take it more seriously or maybe more lightly? Uh, surprisingly, yes. Um, and I say surprisingly uh, only because the older generation, such as my parents, uh, we have very different political views as far as the rest of my family goes my cousins, my siblings, you, we all have the same, we all align the same. Um, but my parents having different political views, more conservative views than me, I was very much worried about uh, how they were going to view this, if they were going to take it seriously, um, if they were going to go, you know, through the proper mandates that were being put out by the counties, by the state, by the nation. Um, I was, I was very nervous about that. It did give me a lot of anxiety, but they, they, their views were pretty much like mine. They understood stood that we needed a mask um, to mask up. They understood that, you know, we couldn't see each other, that we needed a social distance. And I think that that comes from them not wanting to get sick uh, and not wanting to have to, uh, you know, have the potential of, of possibly uh, being undertaken by the virus. Um, so I'm very grateful that, you know, that, that they did uh, listen to the science and uh, despite what the president, the former president was saying at the time who <clears throat> they did support, despite whatever he was saying, you know, they still took it upon themselves to take accountability for their health. Uh, and and that, that was a little shocking to me uh, because again, of their political views, but I'm very happy that, that they weren't anti-maskers or felt that this was a hoax or that it was just gonna go away and they took it serious uh, because it is something that's very serious. Yes, I'm glad that they took it seriously as well. <clears throat> Next set of questions, I'd like to talk about how you've seen COVID-19 affect family members and friends. You've mentioned that you visited the RGV a couple of times during the pandemic. So I'd also like to talk about what differences, if any, you've witnessed between the RGV and San Antonio and their response to the pandemic, because I know that you do live in San Antonio, um, but you have traveled uh, to the RGV on occasion. So the first thing that we're gonna go over um, is your family. So you mentioned in our pre-interview that you said your parents and siblings live in Kingsville. Um, did you travel at all to visit your parents or siblings during the pandemic? Yeah, I traveled. I believe three times. Uh, one of the times I stayed in the car, I just really wanted to see my parents. Uh, it was probably maybe right, getting close to summer of last year. Uh, I hadn't seen my parents in months. It was um, becoming uh, difficult. There was a lot of anxiety. There was a lot of unknown. So I went to go see my, my parents. I, think, I believe it was for Mother's Day. Um, it might have been some type of holiday, Mother's Day or Father's Day. We drove down, stayed in the car, took, you know, just waved, I think took some flowers maybe. Um, and then after that, uh, I want to say, I think I might have traveled two more times, definitely for Christmas. I didn't go for Thanksgiving. We were very, um, my parents were very unhappy about that. Uh, but I was very nervous. Uh, I knew that there was going to be a spike. I knew that there was probably a spike from after, um, after Halloween. So, uh, and I had, I, I didn't get the opportunity to work from home. I only worked from home for about a month. So uh, I was very nervous to go see them. Um, but for Christmas, I did, I did make that happen. I, Christmas is very important to my family. It's very important to my parents. So I made Christmas happen, masked up, stayed social distanced, uh, was outside a lot. Um, I, it was very nerve wracking for me uh, because I didn't want to put them in any type of situation, especially since I had to have been, I had to work. So uh, 
you know, I was around people who didn't wear masks. And, and so it made me very nervous uh, to go visit them. But those were the few times that I did. Um, and each time, you know, I wore a mask, they wore a mask, my girlfriend wore a mask. Uh, you know, we tried our best to stay outside and be distanced and just just try to enjoy each other's company and, and in an environment and a world that we weren't used to doing. Yeah. Um, how did the pandemic impact family traditions, customs, and holiday celebrations? For example, did you celebrate <clears throat> birthdays and Christmas differently? Did you have a traditional giving? I know you already touched base on that a little bit, but can you elaborate a little more? Sure. Uh, so for Thanksgiving, as you know, we always like to all get together as a family. Um, and we weren't able to do that. And so that was very difficult. Uh, I don't remember what you guys did. I think you guys were together, right? But, uh, you know, I, I didn't go down for Thanksgiving. I didn't even go over to your house for Thanksgiving because I know that I believe you guys were here to, or there in San Antonio. Um, so that was very different. Uh, it was just, it was just me and my girlfriend and, uh, you know, we just stayed in and we didn't, we didn't do anything at all. Um, my parents, I believe that they just stayed in. Uh, I think they might've gone over to my brother's house who lives in Kingsville, who they were all taking it very serious. So I wasn't too worried about them being together. Uh, uh, but yeah, that was, that was something that would, hadn't happened in probably my whole life. Uh, every Thanksgiving is big. Every Thanksgiving is, a, is very elaborate. Every Thanksgiving is filled with a lot of family. And so that was probably the first time in my life where I didn't have that. Um, as far as Christmas, pretty much the same thing. You know, Christmas is always spent with a lot of family. It's always spent uh, with a lot of drinking <laughs> and, and a lot of, you know, having a good time. And that wasn't something that we got to do. You know, it was very much uh, crypt like, I guess it, it was, um, you know, we just sat around, tried to keep distance, had masks on, couldn't hug, um, you know, couldn't be close to each other. So um, that was definitely out of the norm for us uh, because we are a big a family and we do enjoy each other's presence. So uh, that definitely put a hamper in, in our usual traditions. Same thing with, with New Year's as well. We didn't do anything for New Year's. Me and my girlfriend stayed home for New Year's, uh, didn't go to my parents, didn't go see family. And that same thing with that, you know, we, we enjoy each other's company. We like being together for New Year's and that was something that we, we didn't get to do. So the holidays were definitely lonely um <clears throat> definitely full full of a lot of high anxiety uh and and um you know very mundane and just very very plain it was uh unusual and out of the ordinary for our family yes it was <laughs> did you feel the need to self-quarantine once you got home from visiting um your fa your family um during the holidays or any other time that you visited them and then why or why not no, a um, couple reasons. Uh, one being the fact that whenever I did go visit them, uh, small town Kingsville, they never went out. My mom uh, had to go to work, uh, but she has her own office space. So I wasn't too worried about bringing anything back with me. I was more worried about taking something to them uh, because I'm coming from a bigger city to a very smaller city, uh, you know, bigger cities in San Antonio. It was... It, it was rampant, you know, it got pretty wild there for a second, whereas Kingsville or Kings County, not so much. And I knew that they were staying safe. I knew that they were staying home. So I wasn't worried about self-quarantining whenever I came back. And the other reason I probably wouldn't have been able, uh, given the opportunity because I had to go into work. Um, I didn't have an opportunity to, you know, tell my boss, hey, I was out of town, I need a self-quarantine type of thing. Um, I had to go into work. So even if I wanted to, uh, there might not have been that opportunity, especially because I wasn't traveling out of state. I wasn't traveling to a bigger city. I wasn't, uh, whenever I did go home, you know, I wasn't partying. I didn't have anybody to, you know, see besides my family. So um, the self-quarantining was something that I really didn't have to do. Okay. Um, you said you also traveled to the Valley a few times during the pandemic. Is there a difference that you saw in how San Antonio handled the pandemic in terms of social distancing, mask wearing, open, open establishments, et cetera, and the Rio Grande Valley? 
No, uh, at, at least not in Edinburgh or Hidalgo County. I didn't see much of a difference. Um, everybody was still masked up. Everybody was still taking it very seriously. Uh, the valley got hit very, very hard. It's under-resourced, so it made it even more uh, extreme um, when they got hit versus Bear County, San Antonio. But I didn't see much of a difference in terms of um, how serious the Rio Grande Valley took uh, the pandemic, at, at least not in the few times that I did go visit during you know, the, the height of everything. Um, of course, you have your downtown area that's going to be, you know, uh, have its own um, set of rules uh, in San Antonio, not so much. I work downtown, so um, there wasn't that many people. I mean, it was pretty uh, empty for the most part every time I got out of work, which was extremely unusual because downtown's always busy, always has a lot of people working around. The hotels are always packed. Um, I didn't go downtown in, in, in McAllen in Hidalgo County, which is where you know, typically all, all the uh, action happens. I didn't do that. Um, but I do know that I think, I believe it was open and it was a little bit more free down there, which would probably be the difference. As far as San Antonio, everybody pretty much stuck to it with the exception of a couple places, uh, well, a handful of places, but San Antonio is so much larger that I, you know, it, it's easy to get away with things whenever you're all over the place and different bars all over, you know, it's not like a central area where as in the valley, it's more central, you know, where the, the bar is at, uh, things like that, because that would be the only contrasting difference. But other than that, I think um, for the most part, both counties did a good job at trying to take it seriously. Bear County did a very good job at, at, at taking it seriously, um, especially when some of the mandates were getting lifted and saying, hey, governor, we're not gonna do that. You know, we're gonna do it this way, uh, but other than that, not so much of a difference. Okay, well, that's good to know. <laughs> it's good that uh, different places that you visited are taking the um, coronavirus seriously. Um, another thing I wanna to touch base on, you mentioned during our pre-interview that your younger sister works in a COVID unit and contracted the, virus, the coronavirus herself along with her wife. Can you share more about their experiences and how they're holding up now? Sure, uh, yeah, so my sister, got licensed to be a respiratory therapist right when COVID happened. I mean, she was just a baby as far as licensure uh, is concerned. So I was very nervous, very scared for her. Um, gave me a lot of anxiety over the situation, knowing that she was going to be thrown into a situation where there wasn't enough PPE, where there wasn't enough knowledge, um, there wasn't enough resources and she's a respiratory therapist, respiratory, it's a respiratory uh, virus. So she's working directly with these patients who have COVID. So um, yeah, that was a very, very much a nerve wracking time for me. She did contract COVID uh, at the facility that she was with at the time, um, which was also very nerve wracking because I wanted to make sure that she was gonna be okay. Uh, she did give it to her wife. Thankfully, they were both perfectly fine. Well, not perfectly, they, they went through it for two weeks. Uh, you know, they lost their sense of smell, lost their sense of taste, high fever, headaches, body aches. Uh, they had the whole, you know, the whole shebang probably besides I think uh, stomach issues. I don't think they had stomach issues, which I know some people do get, but they got over it in, in, in the two weeks. They got their sense of smell back. They're perfectly healthy now. And I'm just very thankful that, that they're okay and that they didn't suffer any, term of, any type of long-term effects that you can't suffer from COVID uh, because it does wear and tear on the body very much. It does wear and tear on your respiratory system, your lungs. So I'm very happy, very fortunate that that, that didn't happen to them. Um, but it was a, a very scary time, especially since it happened pretty early on in the pandemic, I, I want to say um, maybe like April last year. So that was still fairly early on, and it was uh, it was a time where um, the the cases were just rising, and we weren't seeing any type of plateau or any, any type of decrease. Mm -hmm. um, did either of them lose a job during the pandemic? No, uh, uh, no, neither of them lost a job. Um, my sister was able to keep hers, and I mean they need respiratory therapists, so. You know, her, her job is pretty much secure. 
um, for for a very long time. I mean, it's always going to be a secure position, but even more so now because you know, she was needed. So they didn't lose a job, um, neither of them. So very fortunate for that as well. Yes, that's really, really good. Um, and is your sister still working in a COVID unit? Uh, not primarily a COVID unit. Um, she started doing contract work now. So uh, she's a contract respiratory therapist. She'll stay on a contract for anywhere from like six to 10 weeks, I believe, or some type of time, longer time frame like that. Uh, and she gets uh, sent out. So right now she's in El Paso. Uh, not so much working um, primarily in a COVID unit, but working as, in, as a whole as a respiratory therapist within the, um, I believe, university system over there uh, at the hospital in El Paso. Um, for a while, she was having to do COVID unit whenever it was, you know, getting getting pretty crazy. I believe that she did do a lot of uh, strict COVID unit work because a lot of the respiratory patients at the time needed that. Um, uh, you know, you have a, a wide variety of why people uh, have respiratory issues, you know, bad accident, they can't breathe on their own, um, you know, a type of disease where they can't breathe on their own. But at the time, COVID was the leading issue for respiratory um, uh, problems so she was focused on that okay um and then i know that we talked about this a little bit but i want to go back um and maybe you can explain a little more do your views of the pandemic and your response to the virus differ from your parents views and then how so no uh i think one thing that i will say uh, is a little bit different is probably um, I have a I have a view of uh, collectivism. I believe as, as a society we need to uh, act in a collective type of way. Whereas my parents, mainly my dad, has a more uh, individualistic type of view. Um, and the reason why I bring that up is in in terms of taking responsibility now that we're able to get vaccines and being vaccinated. So for example, I'll throw out an example. We were at an IHOP in Kingsville. Everything, everybody's still supposed to wear masks as far as the workers go. Uh, that was on the sign before we went into the IHOP. Uh, our waiter was not wearing a mask. I mean, he came up to us without a mask. He was the only uh, employee in the whole establishment that wasn't wearing a mask. And that made me very upset. Uh, thank God we're vaccinated, so that's fine. But the reason why I got upset was because there's people around us who may not be vaccinated. Um, not because, you know, maybe because they don't want to, sure but also because of uh, the ability to get one. You know, even though we're, it's rolling out at a high rate, there's still trouble getting some. We still have a large population that has not been vaccinated. Uh, Kingsville is an under-resourced um, city in an under-resourced county. You know, there's people that might not have been, had the opportunity to get vaccinated. And here this employee is walking around without a mask. You know, it, it just, I, it made me upset because I was thinking about other people and, you know, my dad's response was, well, you know, they can go get vaccinated if they have a problem with it. And my response was, well, he's working, you know, there's a mask mandate. What if they weren't able to get vaccinated? It's disrespectful to walk up to people, be their server, or, or, or even, a, you know, it, is, it didn't have to even be a service industry. It could have been a bank or anything else. Uh, and not be masked up whenever, you know, even especially if they're masked up, if they sit down, they have their mask on, you know, it's disrespectful to me. At, at that point, you're just thinking about yourself. Um, and, and as a society, we can't do that because we see how that has affected us during the pandemic because we had a former president who was very much an individualistic type of person. Uh, he governed on a very much individualistic type of view. Uh, and it 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 really uh, took a toll on our country. Um, you know, it spread the pandemic like wildfire because of that. Whereas if we would have just thought about our neighbor, uh, and thought about the person next to us, and taken a more collective type of view on on handling this, we could have got a better grasp at it. So, I think that that's where we contrast um, at, at that point. Especially since my my parents are very Christian, so I'm like, hey, you know. Jesus wouldn't have said that, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Jesus wouldn't have said, well, if they want to get the vaccine, you know? No, like, no, it's more of a think about your neighbor, love thy neighbor. That's the whole point of, you know, everything. But 
um, that's that's where we contrast. And it's not like it's such a stark contrast. I think that my dad just kind of gets into uh, little fits of, you know, these are my rights type of thing when in reality, it's like you got to put that away for the better of the society. So that's where that's what I believe. But he has his own beliefs and that's fine. I still love him for it. We're working on it. <laughs> <laughs> I feel that <laughs> we're working. I still love him for it. We're working on it. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you for sharing that. Um, I know that you mentioned in our pre-interview also that you lost a family member to COVID. Would you mind sharing more about that? Yeah, um, had a dream about him last night, so that's really weird. But yes, I lost my uncle. Uh, I, I, I actually lost three family members, two that um, were distant family members, and then my uncle, my mom's brother. Uh, the other two was my grandma's sister. My grandma passed away back in 2007. Um, her sister, who was the last of their family, the last of the siblings, passed away from complications. She contracted COVID, was able to get over it, and then the complications of it, the after effects, uh, were too much for her. So she succumbed to them. Um, my mom's cousin, uh, her first cousin passed away. He was, uh, I believe, about 50 years old or so, um, fairly healthy. So that was hard. And I think when he passed, that really opened up my parents' eyes, my mom's eyes. Not that she was uh, anti-masker uh, or didn't take it seriously, but it made it real because it would, it would be like, like you, like one of my cousins, you know, who's my age, passing away from, from this. And it's like, wow, like that's, you know, like perfectly healthy, you were perfectly fine. And then it took you over. Um, he passed away first. My uncle, <clears throat> he contracted COVID. Um, it took a toll on his body. He was fine. Uh, we thought he was fine uh, for, for about a week or so. Um, he felt fine. And then one day to the next, it was like he was in the hospital. And then after that, couldn't breathe on his own. And then after that, um, he succumbed to, to COVID, which was very, very hard on our family, uh, very hard on, on my mom, very hard on me. I'm still having a very hard time dealing with that, uh, but, um, but yeah. Okay, um, thank you for sharing that. Um, do you believe that things would have, could have been different if he had been hospitalized somewhere with more COVID resources, where where was he hospitalized <clears throat> first? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, in the valley. He's from the valley, uh, from the uh, like the Harlingen area. Okay. Um, so that's where he was. I believe he was in Harlingen or Brownsville. I can't I can't remember the name of the hospital. Um, but I I like to think that he might have had more of a chance if he was hospitalized somewhere uh, in San Antonio or Dallas, Houston, a, a bigger city. Um, the Valley does not have the type of treatment that is available in bigger cities. And that's simply because bigger cities have what we call hospital districts. We pay higher taxes in San Antonio to be a hospital district, to be able to have better resources. Same thing in Dallas, same thing in Houston. Uh, you, pay, you pay higher taxes, you get more resources. Uh, in the Valley, unfortunately, that's not the case. Um, is there an opportunity to possibly make it into a high, uh, hospital district? I'm sure. Uh, is it one? No. Um, so I, I do believe that he didn't get the amount of treatment that others have received for that reason. Uh, simply because of, of the lack of resources, um, the lack of proper treatment, uh, and the lack of funds that they have. Uh, so I do feel very, very much sad for the people in, in the Rio Grande Valley who uh, are suffering with COVID, who contracted COVID, who are currently in the hospital for COVID, because I don't think that they're, they're, they're getting the treatment that other places are getting, and that, that um, includes my uncle. That includes my uncle. I, I genuinely feel like he could have gotten something, something else. It, it may, it may have helped, and that would have been wonderful. And it may have not, but at least you know there was a. At least he would have had the opportunity if you know he would have been somewhere else. But that's nothing that was on my family. Uh, that's nothing that my family could have done. Uh, you know, there is nothing that that they could have done to change that. It was simply resources, and that was all. Um, 
Uh, but yeah, there is there is a contrast in depending on on where you contract COVID, what hospital you're going to go to, and that that doesn't just go for the Rio Grande Valley; that goes for all of Texas. Um, you know, the little areas of Texas, the little counties, um, for example, you know, Corpus still, you know, Kingsville, same thing. You go out to East Texas, West Texas, North Texas, the smaller counties that just don't have the same resources. Uh, you know, I feel very badly for them as well. But, you know, it's always hard to uh, get people the care that they need in um, in the environment that we have as far as our country goes with healthcare with our healthcare system. Um, you know, the, the more money you have, you know, the, the more access you have to care. And that's, that's what it is. You know, some people are able to get flown out to big counties and get their care, not just with the pandemic, but in any type of situation and others aren't. Um, and healthcare shouldn't be based on uh, how much money you have, it shouldn't be based on monetary uh, status. Uh, it should be based on health status. Um, but yeah, those are my feelings as far as uh, whether or not I think that if he received better treatment, if he would have, we would have been okay. It, I'm not too sure, but I uh, sure would have liked the Rio Grande Valley to have given him the opportunity for that. Um, can you share what impacted you most about your uncle's hospitaliz hospitalization? For example, were any family members able to visit him or communicate via cell phone? uh um cell phone yeah uh visiting no um uh yeah that was that was very hard um i'm gonna try to keep it together uh but yeah they weren't they weren't able to visit him my mom my mom his sisters uh, so my aunts uh and my cousin his daughter who is um a couple years younger than me wasn't able to visit him. So he had to, uh, he had to be in there alone. Um, and I think that has uh, been a very difficult thing for me to digest. So, yeah. Okay, thank you for sharing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. No, no, take your time, take your time. I totally understand. Um, if you attended his funeral or heard about it, can you share what it's like to attend a funeral in pandemic times? For example, what is different now versus going to a funeral before the pandemic? Um, Zoom, uh, not so much Zoom, but I guess virtual. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I had to do, unfortunately, um, which is also very difficult, but that was uh, the only way to be able to, um, pay my respects to him was virtually. I watched a, I watched a recorded uh, a ceremony for him. Um, and my mom got to attend, uh, so that was great. Everything was socially distanced. Uh, they did a very good job. The, the funeral home and, and the, the service was very great. Um, but as far as us getting to be there, I didn't get to be there. Uh, so that was very hard for me to, to process um, and hard to go through. So yeah, yeah definitely uh, makes, makes things a lot more difficult to lose somebody during this time in that way. Yeah. I understand. And I really appreciate you sharing that uh, story with us. I know that that is not easy. So yeah. I really appreciate that. Um, we're going to move on to another section. Um, I want to talk about your work-related challenges uh, with your or and, and your work in the law office. Mm -hmm. um, so, for the first question I have, can you share with me how long you've been an attorney and what kind of law you practice? Sure, I've been an attorney for about a year and six months, going on two years. I got licensed um, in October of 2019. Uh, so. I'm still a fairly young attorney. Um, I'm sorry, what was the other question? Uh, well, that's how long I <laughs> uh, it was what, what kind of law you practice? Oh, oh, I practice personal injury law, uh, which surprisingly stayed busy when there was no cars on the road. I don't know how that happened, but we were busy. So uh, fortunately, unfortunately type of thing, you know, I don't, I don't ever like to, uh, I guess, um, harp too much on the positives of why I'm busy because that means people get injured and I don't like when people get injured. 
Um, but yeah, I was, we were able to stay busy. So that was, that was good for us. Uh, good for my, my employer because it's his firm. So he was able to keep his business. Um, but yeah, I do all personal injury work. I don't practice any other type of law. Okay. And how did your typical work day look before the pandemic? <clears throat> Uh, not very much uh, different than what it looks like now. Get up in the morning, commute, get there, uh, put in nine, 10 hours of work, uh, uh, grind it out all day and come back home. Uh, I did, we did do remote for about a month, I believe. And that was uh, maybe mid-March, late March to about April, early May type of situation i believe we went back in may i want to say we went back in may i know it wasn't more than two months um very brief we're a small office it's just uh me my boss who's my employer he's the other attorney uh paralegal legal assistant intern type of situation we're a small office we have another uh, attorney who offices with us so it's him uh, and his paralegal so that's what a total of like six seven people at any time in the office um, sometimes more depending if other attorneys walk in, et cetera. But there wasn't very much of a difference. Uh, the only difference was the time that we did have to work from home because we were forced to, uh, not because, you know, not because my boss said, okay, let's work from home, but we literally, everything was shut down. So we had no choice. Um, once that got lifted, we went back into the office. So there wasn't really a difference between then and now, as far as how my day looks. Okay, and then another question with um, when trials were being put on hold and like the courts were closed, like everything was closed. What did that mean <clears throat> as a lawyer? Did it did it affect you in any way? Did it impact your your work, your everyday like workflow um, when the courts and trials were being put on hold and or closed? Well, um, not necessarily because uh, with civil litigation, which is what I do, um, we don't often need to go to court. Uh, we do have to have hearings occasionally, depending on the situation. Uh, as far as trials go, about 90% of the cases get settled before trial. Uh, so it doesn't really impact civil litigation too much, specifically personal injury. Criminal law, yes, that's gonna be a big hamper in the criminal law realm because they're constantly in the courthouse. They're constantly in and out uh, doing hearings. Um, having trials, uh, things like that. There's, they're, they're always in there. As far as uh, it goes for us, not so much. The thing that did kind of affect us more was um, pre-trial matters, uh, but litigation matters, such as uh, depositions, mediations, because we do those in, well, we did do those in person. Now they're all remote. Um, but having a uh, having those be paused or having to have those rescheduled because we had a lot that was scheduled when the pandemic pandemic happened. So uh, our cases weren't able to get settled as fast as we wanted them to uh, because we had to push everything back. So now it's affecting us now because now we're super busy. <laughs> now we're double booking. Now, uh, you know, we're very, very busy. Our calendars are filled because uh, we're trying to get all, you know, catch up, play catch up. And I think we've done a very good job of that. Uh, so far, um, I want to say that both sides, plaintiff and defendant, are both trying to get things caught up and, and things rolling. So it uh, didn't really affect me at the time, uh, but it's affecting us now because now we're able to navigate in a, in a remote world, in a virtual world where everything's being done virtually, including trials, including trials. So um, I want to say Bear County has already had trials done virtually, so they're rocking and rolling with that. Uh, poss possibly having, a po there's a possibility that things are going to be back in person as far as hearings and trials going soon, I believe. Um, but as of right now, all virtual. Okay. And then um, what measures, if any, did your law firm take to secure your job security? Um, I'm not too sure. Uh, I always felt like my job was pretty secure. I, uh, I didn't really feel like there was going to be a time where it wasn't um, just because we are a smaller, a smaller firm, big firms, I know had the issues of furloughing people, um, uh, and letting people go. We didn't really, I didn't, I, I didn't feel 
like my job was insecure, there was still a lot of work to be done and a lot of work that I needed to get done, um, which I'm very thankful for that I was able to keep my job. Yeah. Um, okay. Did your workplace require you to travel at all during the quarantine? Um, <clears throat> no, no, not at all. Uh, travel to work. That's about it. <laughs> In San Antonio, it's basically traveling. And you have to commute uh, for about, you know, 20, 30 minutes. But um, no, no traveling. Everything is done virtually. Everything's done through Zoom. Okay. And then how did your firm make use of technology in new ways during this pandemic? Having to navigate through doing hearings, doing depositions, doing mediations on Zoom. Um, whenever we did work from home, we didn't we didn't check in with Zoom. We just, you know, did our thing. I talked to my boss uh, as frequently as as I could without annoying him, <laughs> without him, you know, uh, getting annoyed by me, you know, asking questions or um, asking him things. Uh, but I wouldn't say that we needed to use technology too much in our workplace besides us attorneys having to conduct um again mediations depositions virtually that would be the only uh use of technology that we've we've put in uh, at work okay and then do you think some of these pandemic related changes to your job will continue after this pandemic gets under control why or why not um i don't know i guess it I guess that would depend on whether or not opposing counsel wants to keep, you know, opposing counsel on whatever case we have wants to do things through Zoom or do things in person. Um, uh, it, it didn't, we didn't have to, I guess what I'm trying to say is we didn't switch from working in person to working remotely and then decide to stay working remotely where I know like uh, larger firms have now decided to stay working remotely. They didn't, you know, the, the need to go into the office is pretty much non-existent in my opinion. I mean, if I had the opportunity to work remotely, I would uh, because I don't, I can function perfectly well in a remote situation with open lines of communication. Um, we didn't do that uh, in our workplace because we're, um, again, we're a smaller firm. So we were able to function, you know, well together with only a small group of people, uh, uh, you know, in one building at one time. Um, I don't, I don't, I'm not too sure if things will stay remote. Uh, I kind of foresee that they will because it's just convenience. It's better than having to, we have to go, uh, you know, do a deposition for a defendant that's in a totally different county. It's more convenient and takes less time out of my day and less time uh, for me having to travel, uh, you know, to a different county just to do a deposition when I can do that through Zoom, be done in two, three hours, and then be on to my next task you know, versus taking a whole day's work to go travel, do a deposition, travel back type of thing. So I think everything will probably, hopefully stay virtual. <laughs> hopefully, right? <laughs> yeah, hopefully. <laughs> um, can you share with me one of your more interesting days at work during this pandemic? If, if you had any. <laughs> um, I don't think I have any. <laughs> I mean, most of it's probably like paperwork, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, there's nothing very interesting. Uh, I think it's the most interesting it gets is our doing depositions through Zoom or doing mediations. It's uh, um, sometimes clients or even, uh, you know, defendants don't really understand that even though it's through Zoom, it's still a legal proceeding. Uh, you're still under oath. You can still perjure yourself, you know. You can't be... Uh, walking around uh and you know being deposed answering deposition questions in your house like just you know walking around in your pjs you know what i'm saying your hair not done type of thing like no this could be shown to a jury so you, you know it's <laughs> that's probably the most interesting is having to uh you know be in a deposition and see the person i'm deposing and i'm just like wow like you're really walking around like that right now and i'm asking you questions <laughs> and you're under oath okay all right, you know, that's cool. Uh, that's interesting, uh, but that's about it. Other than that, everything else is just paper. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you for that. Um, what protocols, if any, did you have in place to ensure your clients would continue to be represented? Um, 
I don't, I don't think any, uh, we, we didn't really have a problem with uh, continuing to work. We didn't really have a problem with ensuring that we would be able to continue to advocate uh, for our clients. So I, I wouldn't say that there's any protocols, anything that's different from a pre-pandemic world to a intro pandemic world to a post-pandemic world, as far as uh, protocols go to advocate. That's good. Um, it's good to know that um, your law office took all of the uh, measures necessary to continue advocating for people who needed that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you know of any employee or support staff member who received a pay cut, lost work, or has been furloughed because of the pandemic? Mm -mm. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't deal with the pay aspect, uh, and I don't ask how much um, our support staff's getting paid. But as far as I know, I don't, I don't believe so, and, I, and nobody got let go because of it. So mm -hmm. that's awesome. That's really good to hear. Um, so for the final questions, um, I'm, I want to ask you, um, first one is, are you satisfied with the local response to COVID-19 in San Antonio? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say I am. Uh, there were times where the governor or, or the president, the former president would say one thing and our mayor and our county judge were like, oh, well, you know, in Bear County, it's so high. So we're going to try to do it this way. Um, so I'm pretty, pretty satisfied with the fact that they stuck to their guns with ensuring that fellow San Antonians were being taken care of, uh, you know, um, fellow residents of Bear County were, were being taken care of and trying to do their best to put a hamper into the pandemic, uh, into the cases here in Bear County. Okay, and are you satisfied with the state response uh, to COVID-19 led by Texas and Greg Abbott? <laughs> no, <laughs> not at all. I'm not at all satisfied with uh, uh, with Mr. Abbott, uh, Governor Abbott, so if I may. Um, I'm not satisfied with it at all. Uh, I'm very disappointed. Uh, I'm not surprised, that's for sure, um, but it's very disappointing uh, to know that um, the people of Texas are basically pawns in a political game and their lives are pawns in a political game in the middle of a very deadly pandemic that is highly transmittable, uh, is extremely serious. Um, I feel like he's playing politics and it is what it is. You know, that's that, those are my feelings. I think he's done a horrible, horrible job. Um, and I can't wait to vote him out. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, are you satisfied with the current, the current national response to COVID-19 led by President Biden and his administration? Um, I am satisfied with what Biden's done so far. It's such a stark contrast um, <laughs> from our former president. Uh, so it's very easy to be satisfied with him because uh, anything that he does that's any type of positive uh, towards wanting to put a, a dent in cases, wanting to be serious about um, focusing on getting us back to normal, uh, you know, getting getting people vaccinated. Any little thing is gonna automatically make him better. So I, yeah, I am satisfied with him. Uh, I, I appreciate, I was talking with this, uh, one of my friends pointed this out yesterday, we were watching uh, a little snippet of the news and he Biden had his mask on and he was like, you know, I like that he wears his mask, even though he's still vaccinated. And that's great because it shows accountability and it shows um, an example that he's setting an example. Uh, and so I, I think that's that's really awesome. And I think that he's done a, a fairly pretty good job so far with being transparent and uh, getting the vaccines rolled out in an effective, efficient manner. I agree with you wholeheartedly. <laughs> Um, if you had the power to respond to COVID-19 with policies, laws, or workplace decisions, what would you do differently, if anything? A lot. Um, <laughs> a lot of things. I, I feel like I'm constantly saying, wow, like I would have done that so different uh, in a lot of different, in a lot of different aspects. Um, you know, uh, on a national scale, I would have done things differently if I was the president. Uh, on a state scale, I would have done things differently if I was governor. Um, and I probably would have done things a little bit differently if I had my own firm. Uh, that's not to say that, you know, 
I don't think that some of these people tried their best. Um, but I just think that personally speaking, the way that I view things and the way that I viewed the pandemic, I would have done things. I would have done things differently. Uh, you know, the mass mandate that became a, a political tool that they got to use, uh, you know, to, to rally up a certain base of people. Um, and I think that, that, that that's very uh, disheartening that, that the pandemic became a partisan political issue, something that, that we are all suffering as, as, as Americans, as, you know, as citizens of this country or, you know, not citizens of this country, Black, you know, let the lack of citizenship doesn't matter. Everybody that was in this country was suffering through it and the pandemic was made political and it cost people's lives and it should not have even gotten to that point in the first place. It should have never become political. It should have been, this is something that we need to face as a country and we're going to do it together. And, you know, we're going to make sure that we can save as many American lives as possible. And it just goes to show that they don't really care about their constituents, whether it be on a national scale, whether it be on a state scale, or even some counties, cities as well, mayors, you know, um, you know, some mayors are just wilding out. They're like, you know, the, the governor said, we don't need masks. All right. The city doesn't need masks. And, you know, it's, that's not the case, you know, and um, it just, I don't think that it would have taken us this long to get to the point that where we're at, if we just would have taken it serious and not made it political in the first place. And if we had leadership that genuinely genuinely cared about the American people because I don't think that they did. And that cost a lot of lives and it cost the lives of my family members. And it, it cost a lot of pain, um, not just for, for me and my family, but I know for a lot of other families out there uh, and a lot of anxiety and a lot of, you know, um, negative effects that, that didn't need to, to happen simply because of politics. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Um, for the last question, are there any other stories or experiences you would like to share with me that I maybe did not ask about? No, I don't think so. I think uh, I think we hit probably hit everything. <laughs> All of my rants that I do on a daily basis were hit right here. So um, whoever's researching this in a hundred years, <laughs> just know that I ranted about this for the whole pandemic. So you're welcome. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you, Mariah, for your participation in the UTRGB Voices Oral History Project. The stories you have shared with me today will leave a lasting mark for years to come. I appreciate your time and commitment to this project. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thanks for having me.